I don't know if this is true, it's a myth I heard, that you almost didn't read the script for Only Falls. Did I didn't read the script. You before. didn't read it no. at all? <laughs> Between you and I and the millions of viewers out there, I was too drunk. I'd been out with a friend of mine on a long-term date. We said, oh, we will do it. And I kept putting it off, kept putting it off. And eventually he said, it's tonight, we're going to do it tonight. So we went out and we had too much to drink. I can't remember what we were celebrating. Anyway, in those days, scripts used to arrive at your address by a dispatch rider sometimes. There was no email or anything like that, much too early. And this big stack of six episodes came through, was waiting for me on the doorstep. And I thought, well, it's half past 12. I can't sift through six episodes to see which few lines they've given me. So I just looked at the front page of episode one and I went, oh, it's the character's uh, Rodney. Oh, he's on the first page. Oh, he's on the second page. Christ, he's on every page. So I thought I'd better start reading it now because the little handwritten note was, can you come in at lunchtime tomorrow to read and meet Ray Bart, the producer? So I frantically got three or four episodes under my belt and realised how clever it was. Is it right you were the first to be cast out, yeah. out of the three? Yes. Yeah. We read with several Dell characters and then I met Leonard Pierce, who played Grandad and he was just the absolute sweetheart. But then when... David Jason came in, and I have to say that John Sullivan wasn't keen at all to have David on board. Um, but when the three of us started reading together, there was just this spark. What struck you about John as a person when you first met him? Uh, he is so quiet and self-effacing. I still can't talk about him in the past tense, really. He w was just... I've said it a thousand times. He was a genius, but he was so shy. I remember up in the... The bar, there's a, a good example of his, his opinion of himself. We were up in the bar, we'd shot some episodes, and he was telling us a story that had happened to his father during the Second World War when he was working with a group of people and they had to take a chandelier down. But at the time, he was just telling us in the BBC Club bar, because we were all a bit worried because no one was watching the show and we weren't quite sure why it was doing so badly in the ratings. So he was just telling us this story about how they held a sheet under one chandelier and the one at the other end of the hallway fell down. And we thought it was the funniest thing we'd ever heard. And he went, I'm thinking of writing it, but I'm not sure it's funny enough. Do you think, no, it's not going to go. Is it? And he was talking himself out of it to himself. And we said, you've got to do it. It's, it's, it's brilliant. And that was the clip they showed at our first BAFTA. And I just remember looking across at John from the table and just grinning at him. And he had this big beam on his, on his face. So, yeah, he was, uh, he was almost apologising for being a genius. Do you still remember filming that and, mm. and the pressures you were all under yeah. when you had to film that scene because I was told I was to be fired I would be fired if I laughed keep looking at each other and don't say anything and they had various cameras in and Ray Butt our producer at the time he was only about five foot he came up to me and he went if you laugh I will fire you and I'll tell you why we've only got the one chandelier that costs six grand if you laugh at that we've lost the end shot if we've lost the end shot, we've lost the episode. And the BBC won't take five episodes of anything, so they won't take the series. You're out if you laugh. So David went, Christ, that was a bit urgent, wasn't it? Anyway, we went up the ladders, we held the sheet, the, the chandelier, bash. 30 seconds of silence, with David and I just looking at each other the whole time. And just out the corner of my eye, just behind the camera, I can see Ray Butt, who very, very quietly pulled out a hanky and stuffed it in his mouth. And then I can see the shoulders like this. And so that's the longest 30 seconds of my life. And when they put the clapper down and um, we finished the shot, the air went blue. I mean, I went absolutely ballistic with him. I thought, but you terrified. You terrified me. And he, well, I meant it <laughs> because we couldn't lose the shot. I said, yeah, but it didn't really help in my eye line, you shaking and putting a bloody hanky in your mouth. D to do a prequel to start with, I thought, mm, I don't know. Um, but John had been talking about this for a long time and as it got closer and closer to the time where he said, no, I'm, I'm writing it, I'm writing it I, w I want you to play Rodney's father he's this gangster um, and the more he gave me insight to Freddie Robdell's character the more I thought, yeah, that's, that's good but we're talking about the nation's favourite, I think we have to be very, very careful about this anyway, he sent me the script and I thought, I've got to do it, I don't care if no one watches it I've got to do this because the, the, the way he described my character is they're not sure whether he's a hero or just mental. And then we started going through the casting and we were fortunate enough to get Kelly Bright. I watched her the other night. I watched her doing it the other night. She's just absolutely stunning actress. Also, he wanted to get a sense of what the early 60s were like, which I think he did beautifully. And like I said, when I knew I was going to come and do this, I watched Rock and Chips. 
I don't like watching myself at all. But it's doubly heartbreaking because by the time we'd done episode three, uh, John caught this bloody viral pneumonia. How did that whole period unravel? We were we were due to start some more rock and chips. John had texted me that, and I had a, a, a special little ping for John on my phone. He had his own noise. And whenever I heard that, I'd be in the bath or whatever, and I'd just run down and, and see what was going on. I, I don't remember exactly how I found out about the, the illness, but at the time it was, it was serious, but it was no biggie. Yeah. Oh, um, and then they said, oh, he's sitting up in bed, he's okay. Uh, this was on a Tuesday. He's sitting up, he's had food. They reckon there's a good chance he'll be home by the weekend fantastic and then I got a call I think it was Saturday morning from Gareth Quinlan our producer who just said that John had lost his battle and it was I'll never forget it was a beautiful morning such a sunny day and I just looked out of the window in the garden and I thought how, how can it possibly be like this how can it be a bright sunny day when when john's gone how can that happen it was just such an incongruous thing it should be gunmetal gray sky and weeping clouds that's how it should have been and then of course you you get the the moment where you're a victim of your own success and all of a sudden you come home and the press we need a quote. We need this. Can you come and do this? Can you come and do that? Can you come and do it? And you, you kind of feel, well, when, when do we get the chance to grieve? I haven't, I've only just taken this on board. And now all of a sudden you're here telling me to do this. There's microphones. There's, can you do a piece uh, down the line to, for BBC News and things like that? And you think, oh, yeah, I know I should, but I, I physically can't. I can't do it yet. You know, but. Can we assume he's going to be here forever? Don't yeah, he's, he's, well, he is. He is going to be here forever. Fortunately, I always remember Leonard Pierce. He said, "Have you seen these new things? They're called VCRs. Have you got one?" I went, "I haven't got one yet, Leonard, because um, I think they're quite expensive." And he went, "Oh, yeah, but don't you see? That means we're going to be around forever. We're never going to die, are we?" Which I thought was quite a sweet thing to say. And what John also did is he. He made himself part of the show, not not just the writer, um, although people often mistake him for you, um, in the fact that he's there at the beginning and the end of every episode. That's right, they still think it's me. It's not me. It never was me. No, it's John. Is that, is that something you've had to answer questions about all through? Every the day, yeah. <laughs> it does sound like me. It does, I, yeah. I, I say that's that was me, but it wasn't. I know that John hated it and he had to get quite drunk to do it, apparently. It just means we can hear him now, whatever yeah. falls us on, yeah. as well as knowing that, that that he wrote it. Yeah. How do you think he'll be remembered? With joy, I think he'll he'll just be remembered with. I can't say his name or or see his face without smiling, because he was just such a wonderful person as well. A quiet genius is what he was. Um. I can't really say more than I will miss him so much and I he's st- he still got his special ping on my phone and I can't bear to erase the voicemails <laughs>